Hi guys and welcome back to the channel and back to the second episode of our very casual, very entertaining first aid video. Today we're going to be talking about actions at an emergency. Hi guys, subscribe to my channel now so that you do not forget. Hit that bell icon and get notified of my further uploads. Lastly, feel free to comment. Show me some love by giving me a thumbs up at the end of the video. The first thing we're going to talk about is how to recognize an emergency. The bystander is a vital link between the victim and medical care. In most situations, the bystander will be the first person to recognize the problem and be there to actually give aid to a patient. But in order for a bystander to be able to help someone, they will first have to be able to recognize the problem. At one point in your life, you're going to have to decide whether you want to help a person or not. If you have considered previously to help people, then you would probably become more involved when a situation arises. Therefore, the best time to make a decision whether you're going to help someone or not is to make the decision before an emergency arises. Now, let's say you get to a situation, or let's say you get into a situation where there's an accident or a specific scene. There's a few steps that you need to do. The first thing that you need to do is to do a scene size up. That means you have to go into the scene or approach a situation with situational awareness. Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of what's happening to the person. Look at your own safety first. That's always a golden rule is safety first. Because if you get injured, who's going to help you? You are there to help a person, you might be the only one in the area, now you get injured as well, and then we have two victims instead of one. So always look around and see what can injure you, and what is a hazard. Now a hazard is anything with the potential to cause harm to you. So the only way to get rid of a hazard is to either move it out of the area, if it's electricity, switch the electricity off, if it's tripping hazards, move the stuff out of the way, if the patient or the person is having like an epileptic seizure, move everything away around him to make sure that he doesn't injure himself. So always be there to protect yourself as well as the person that you are helping. Secondly, get an impression of what happened. Is it an illness? Is it an attack? Was it an accident? You know, what caused the situation that you are in? How many people are involved? Is it one person? Is it a taxi full of people? Is it a bus? You need to know um, what you are dealing with when you get there. And the biggest thing is guys, stay calm. It doesn't help to panic. We were told um, when we were in class, if you don't know what you're doing, act like you know you do. If you stay calm, 
the people around you will stay calm. The next step, obviously, once you've sized up the scene and you know what you're dealing with, is having to call backup. Netcare, which is 082911, and ER24, which is 084124. Then you can contact the two major ambulance services, private ambulance services. Phoning government ambulance services in Africa is a waste of time because they will either tell you they don't come out, they don't have an ambulance available, or you're going to wait four hours for them to arrive. They're useless. See, on this channel, we say it as it is. We don't care. When you, uh, before you start to call the ambulance, you need to know what you're dealing with, as we've said before. Delaying the call could be the difference between the person surviving or not. If you're not sure whether you should call an ambulance or not, call them anyway. They can always be cancelled, or when the ambulance people arrive there, they can tell you if it was serious or not. It's, it's their job. They have to come out. Rather call early enough then delay a call. And if you call the ambulance, because it's never a good idea to transport a patient in your car, maybe transporting him is going to make the situation worse. An ambulance can move through the traffic much faster than you can because of the lights and sirens. And an ambulance is also equipped to deal with anything that can arise. If a person looks fine now, he could get worse on the way with the car and then you can do nothing for him. So rather call an ambulance early enough. Please head over to my webpage at www.cryptzone.co.za and come and check out the page. You will notice there is a lot of information on there. Hyperlinks are provided so that you don't have a problem going anywhere. Head up to my podcast page and come and see what am I currently working on on my podcast. There is also the Cryptzone live page which I will update regularly to let you know when I'm going to do the next show like this one. The goal is to try and do one every week. Head on over to my Cryptzone YouTube page and come and check out what are the latest videos that I am working on and also what new videos is up and coming. If you have any queries or questions, don't hesitate to ask. You can email me at shawl.reaper at gmail.com. So when do you really need to seek medical care? To know when to seek medical care, you need to know the difference between a life-threatening injury and a very minor, sum, a minor injury. For example, abdominal pain can be an ulcer, it can be indigestion, but it can also be an early sign of a heart attack. Wheezing can be because the guy's got asthma, which you can give him his inhaler for and he can use it by himself. But it can also be the start of an allergic reaction, like a bee sting. Not every cut needs stitches, and not every burn needs a hospital. So you have to know when is something very severe, or when is it something small enough for you to handle. So it's always best to err on the side of caution. Always if you suspect that this is a serious situation, call the ambulance first. Don't call your mother, your father, your friend, your doctor, or your employer. Call the ambulance first. Calling anyone else first only wastes time. So now the big question is, how do you call 911 or backup? Well, some people say just pick up the phone and call them. Now this is another thing that we always tell the guys at work as well. Number one, stay calm. Number two, don't do this. Hello, hello, I'm in emergency. My friend got injured. He's in Joburg Street. God, put the phone down. Cool. The guy's panicking. The patient is in Jobert Street. Something happened to him. We have no idea what. Where's Jobert Street? Oh, let's see. There's one in this city, this city, this city, this city, this town. There's like 50,000 50, Jobert Streets. That guy will never get any help. Okay. I know when somebody in close to you or family member gets injured, you tend to totally freak out. But don't. Stay calm. The person on the other side of the line is going to ask you a number of questions. So you must stay calm and answer them. They're going to first ask you, who are you? Where are you calling from? What is your number? How many people has been involved? What exactly happened? Is there a chemical spill? All these questions are there for the person to send out the great amount of help. It doesn't help you tell me there's a fire and I go with a little skid bucky and a little hose when it's a whole building on fire. You need to tell the people exactly what is happening. 
Okay, and never hang up the phone until you have been told to do so. Why do you call backup? For what type of calls do you call backup? In South Africa, we believe that you call an ambulance for anything that has to do with taxi drives. Yeah, they will call you for a headache at 3 o'clock in the morning, 500 k's away, and when you get there, in the drive-in will be a nice BMW or Merc sitting there. Because they believe an ambulance should transport them. They would rather pay that 5,000 Rand or whatever for the transport fees. Or they will tell you she's pregnant and she's about to have the baby. You rush over there just to find she's standing next to the street with the suitcase packed. So, why, uh, so when do you actually call for an ambulance? Firstly, is the patient's condition life-threatening? Could the condition become worse or become life-threatening on the way to the hospital? Would the distance or traffic conditions cause a delay in transportation, of which the ambulance is better suited? And then specific reasons will be fainting, chest or abdominal pain, sudden dizziness, weakness or collapse, difficulty in breathing, shortness of breath, severe or persistent vomiting, sudden and severe pain everywhere in the body, suicidal or homicidal feelings, bleeding that does not stop within 10 to 15 minutes, a gaping wound anywhere in the body, problems with movement or sensation in your back or your toes or legs and you cannot move, cuts on the hands and face, puncture wounds like knife stabs or anything that's protruding into the body, most animal bites and human bites, hallucinations, a stiff neck in, so in association with fever and headaches, which could be meningitis, unequal pupil size and unconsciousness, spinal injury, severe burns, poisoning and drug overdose. So anything that's going to be clearly a life-threatening condition, call an ambulance. Often the best thing that can save a critical situation is if care is provided as soon as possible. And the first person to do that is the bystander. The risk of acquiring an infection disease, infectious disease while helping others is minimal. But it can be even lower if you know how to protect yourself. So here are a couple of blood-borne diseases. So remember to wear your PPE. Always try and have gloves with you, and if you can, a face mask. Thanks to this new uh, virus running around, I'm sure most people have got face masks anyway. Getting into contact with other people's blood without wearing gloves can cause you to get that infection or virus. Especially if you have any cuts or nicks on your hand and you're not wearing any gloves. Now the main things that you have to look out for is hepatitis B, hepatitis C and of course HIV. Hepatitis is a viral infection of the liver and of course we all know HIV can contribute to AIDS which is an immune deficiency disorder. Airborne diseases can be transmitted by somebody coughing or sneezing in your direction. The biggest one is TB or tuberculosis and these days COVID-19. So wearing PPE is, your, is the best way to prevent yourself from getting any infections. So what you need, if you have it, is protective eyewear, protective mask, protective gloves. Always assume that all blood and all fluids are infected. In the workplace, PPE must be accessible at all times and must be provided freely by your employer. So what do you do if you do not have the correct PPE? There are alternate ways of doing it. For example, if you do not have gloves with you, put your hands inside a plastic bag. If you have been trained in the correct procedure, you can use protective barriers to soak up blood or any other fluids. You can clean the area or the spill with an effective disinfectant. Always remember to discard the contaminated materials in a proper bin or biomedical waste bin. Always remember to wash your hands with soap and water after giving any first aid to anyone. If the incident happened at work, always remember to report this incident to your supervisor. Our last little chapter for today is what do you do after everything is said and done? After you've done the first aid. It is always a good idea to talk about it. Most people get post-traumatic stress syndrome because of something they have seen and kept it inside. They didn't talk about it. We always have a debriefing after a call. It's good to get those emotions out and it's good to talk about it. Otherwise, you do what we did, the rest of us do and you just go have a couple of drinks. Have a lot of parties and just enjoy life. 
We do that because we're not alcoholics. We do it because we know the facts of life. We know that death is a certainty. We know that life is short. So we always try to get together with all our friends as much as we can and just have a good time. Just relax and then we talk about everything. We talk shop always, especially when you're around most of your work colleagues. And trust me, it, it works. It really helps. To be a medic or to be a first aid or to be someone who's willing to go out and help people in any situation takes a certain type of person. And sometimes they say we are insane because we are, but in a good way. Well guys, that's all the time we have for, for today. I hope you enjoyed the information I gave you and um, I hope you enjoyed the videos. So please come back for the next one. And if you like this video, give me a thumbs up. Remember to subscribe to my channel if you want to get notified of any further information or any further videos like this one or anything else. Remember to check out my website if you want to know what else is happening in my life. And don't forget to drop a comment. So, have a good day. Cheers.